Well, shalom. Y'all, I just gotta say, praise Yah. If you haven't listened to the last books of the book of Psalm, it always ends with praise Yah. And that's awesome. And you know what? It's necessary to praise Yah because his goodness is super good. Way better than any version of it that we get quick relief from. It transforms us completely. Like this guy, Abraham, champion. I love him so much. He's being transformed day by day. And you know why? I had to go through the, uh, the challenges of realizing that the real problem was not all of the things going on with Abraham and gassy and colicky and frustration and exhaustion and just utter blurry weariness. The root problem, y'all, was that I had an issue that needed to get dealt with called fear. But it's real. Parenting can make you super afraid, y'all. Let's just be a real talk real for a second. Parenting can really freak you out because you're like way in over your head so fast and the birth of a child will totally do that to anybody. It's like, oh my gosh, everything you once knew about your normal is not normal. Look at Jubilee. What is she doing? Jubilee, what are you doing? You stand in. Did you get up there on your own? Let her be, Nay. Look, she's she's really enjoying being up there. What are you doing, Juju? Oh, wow. And twins came in, man. They double dipped with that. Hello, and it was quite girl. intense. Quite intense. But Hello, you know what? Baby, We're coming babies. out of it. That's what it was. And you know what it led me to do? Be like, you know what? I needed to get back into the simple diligence of a basic obedience. Even though my circumstances are wild and ridiculous, I've got to learn to be a man of shalom. My family needs a man of shalom. And then he has shalom. And then everyone has shalom. It's like, wow, peace. But it also means no chaos. Shalom's not such a simple word like we use it. Like, shalomi, homie, which is awesome and a great greeting. However, it's literally like a blessing of peace and of life. And like one of the fundamental characteristics of the descriptions of our great creator. Like if you look around behind me, some of you guys, gals, are just seeing green, right? But then there's other people that are watching this right now and they're fantastically unique humans because they look at this and they see it as like a phone book. They see all the little unique identifiers about the leaves, how the branches come off of each one of these stems and how they bud out, how these shorter plants over here are sucking up sunlight at all levels. If you look behind me, it can look pretty ridiculous, but what you're actually seeing is the most efficient collection system of nutrients on the earth. It's like there is nothing better than this multi-species floor to forest heights megafauna like you're seeing. Everything was designed to fit into that space and collect that much amount of sunlight instead of getting all the big wide open valleys of sun. Look at it. From the top to the bottom, it's collecting sunlight all the way. It's a super unique system. And you know what? It can look a little chaotic in there. Right now, it just looks like walls of green. But inter inside, woven into there, is a tapestry of unique and incredible organisms and creatures and plants and species of animals and bugs and insects that are awesome and spectacular. And they all have incredible properties and each one has a story that could just blow your mind. Like Abraham blew this pacifier. Yes, y'all, we've even been willing to try this. Your whole life can change so fast and you're like, you know what, everything I thought I knew about everything regarding parenting is out the window, y'all. We're gonna do everything we can to overcome. That's the rule of our life. But there's medicinal plants in here that are fantastic. And there's other ones in here that will so ruin your day, like poison ivy, all over. Poison ivy is like the guardian of the trees. It's a vine, so it likes to climb stuff. It's climbing all over like ropes at the base of that big tree over there. Poison ivy. That will just ruin your day. Ruin your day. Maybe ruin your next two or three weeks. However, growing next to it is jewel weed. And jewel weed is super medicinal for curing poison ivy. They're literally yoked together. And you know what? We gotta be evenly yoked because if you're not, you're gonna be like poison ivy all over people's souls and bodies. And you're just a vast cesspool of despair. And you know what? I slipped down into that road a little bit. Full disclosure, I'm not gonna lie. Total sleeplessness can do it to anyone. But all those wi like wicked seeds that were in my soul had to get germinated, sprout out, and just get cut down and mowed over. Like when you wanna prepare a bed site, a garden bed site, and it looks like this out here, you lay a tarp, a, like a thin tarp down over this in the hot sunny days, in like five to seven days, it's gonna kill off all of that stuff. Maybe longer, depending on how hot it is. And all of the seeds that are in there, in the soil bank, 
they're gonna germinate because it's warm and it's dark and damp. And they're like, you betcha, we're coming out for life. But then when they come up out of the surface and they put out their first leaves and their true leaves, they literally can't get any sun because there's this tarp over them. And then they just bake and die. And then you pull off that tarp and you pre prepare your bed space and put in the seeds that you want to. But you're still gonna have to weed because there's other weed seeds that are gonna come in immediately. But that's how you can kind of clear some space in here and create like a little bit of a garden. And this place is bursting with life like that right now. Birds, plants, water, and this is all not far. But you know what? My whole world had gotten caught up in just what was happening right inside the doors that I couldn't even imagine anything else out there. Not the complexities of life. Like this is why when I read the scripture, when in doubt, man, just break your sword out. And I was just, I was struggling with doubt, y'all. Struggling with doubt. And I was finding this just creeping suspicion that like I had been given a cup too full, that my portion was just too much. And I was like, what is the purpose of man? What is love? Because I felt like if anything that I was starting to identify as these ripples in my house that, that were affecting the, so this, the health, the soil health of my home, it was ripples of doubt from fear. And the way to counter that is always going back to the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Like if I have a lack of understanding about something, if I lack wisdom about a topic or an area of life, like raising twins, like I feel very inadequate when it comes to my preparedness level, if that makes sense. Chelsea and I try to be prepared individuals, like prepared individuals. It's just been that way for a long time because where we grew up in Colorado, if you guys haven't been to Colorado, the, the mountains are quite intense, like literally very intense. And when you start to go up above 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 feet, you start to experience symptoms of, of physical oppression on your body that you're just not used to. Some people get that even at 5,000 feet when they fly into Denver or whatever. But as they drive up in altitude, their bodies will consume so much more liquids because you're in a super high desert. The sun's very intense. The UV is very intense and your body dehydrates really fast because there's like 18% moisture in the air, very low. And people will literally, they will go on like a day hike. They'll be like, we're gonna drive into Boulder. We're gonna drive up into the mountains and go for a day hike. And they'll climb, start their hike at 10,000 feet and be like, I'm just gonna walk up to this 12,000 foot meadow and take my nice scenery pictures and come on back down. And they will get these horrific migraines and just splitting stomach aches and not know why. They just feel like crud because their body has gone somewhere that it's not adapted to. It was not prepared for. And a storm can blow in in a matter of minutes. It can go from 75 degrees and beautiful sunny and you're like, oh, perfect shorts and t-shirt weather and you're, you're like leisurely setting up your picnic lunch and a crazy wind will come blowing out of the, you know, the north and the west and just smash down on you and it is snowing and hailing and sleeting on you and raining on you all within a matter of minutes. And so if you're not prepared, ready with your tarp, ready with setting up your camp and your shelter in a bit, they call it a bivouac, like a really fast shelter, pop up a Sukkot. In the Bible, they call them Sukkahs, Sukkahs. If you don't know about it, there's an entire week of the year where you're supposed to go out and hang out with Sukkahs. Anyways, you can practice anytime with tarps. They're fantastic. So anyways, people get deliberately killed by the elements out there. Like the mountains are murderers to people that are unprepared. And so you have to be ready all the time. So Chelsea and I would leave our house all the time. We had the Toyota 4Runner, which is a fantastic car. I highly recommend it. Second gen, for those of you that are like diehards. Yeah, second gen. Anyways, that thing ran to 320,000 miles, over 300,000 miles on it because the guy lied on us about it. And the van number and all that stuff, we had a crazy set of circumstances. I'm pretty sure we brought a drug smuggler's car and uh, the guy ran back the odometer a long ways. So we got it for a steal and we're like, this is fantastic, works for us. But you know what, Yahoo preserved that vehicle and we got all the way into the 300,000 miles on it and didn't even know it with no major issues. Praise be to Yah. That thing, we ran it into the dirt. There's nothing left on it. Fantastic car. Anyways, we used to bug out and practice all that stuff and we're gonna flee to the mountains when the end of the world happens, like you guys, I know it. Don't act like you're not. You're like, you should have a backup plan, but don't rely on it completely because talk to Lot. Anytime you're curious about bug out plans, look at Moses and look at Lot. Look at Abraham. He was dwelling in tents in peace. And he watched everything burn to the ground. Something to consider. But, long, long. my tribe is calling. I'm down here by the creek. I shouldn't have shouted. You better get used to it, we're a shouting family. Anyways, people go into the mountains totally unprepared and they get their butts kicked. They sometimes freeze to death. Sometimes they just freeze little bits of their fingers and their hands off. Other times they die. And that's super bummer, but they don't really advertise too much of that to you people that are outside Colorado. They try to keep that stuff like 
don't tell the world. My family's coming, which is fantastic. But I got to read to you guys something that just grabbed me because I had to go back to the foundations. Anytime I lack knowledge or discretion or preparedness, I go back to my fundamentals. Like I can't find this topic covered in scriptures about baby rearing specifically. I wanted to be able to turn to a verse and be like, that's what it says about twins and how Rebecca raised up Yitzhak's sons, Jacob and Esau, wrestling to death, man, savage. They wanted to kill each other all the time. Anyways, how did she do it? How did they raise him up? Like physically, how did you breastfeed two babies simultaneously? Like how did Rivka do it? They're like, well, she had a wet nurse, man. <laughs> I know she potentially had one. However, and she had one, plenty of them. However, I don't think it was always that they just gave their babies away to other people. I think sometimes they had to figure it out. Joseph and Mary like were a big source of encouragement to, to us when Chelsea was so super pregnant, super sick and dying. And I was having to get her out of our house, move her into a hotel. She's like, well with child, children. Well with children. And I'm sitting there like, I gotta move everything we have ever had and then decontaminate everything. Anyways, I feel like Joseph and Mary. And I'm like, honey, I'm gonna have to take you to Bethlehem. It's called Van Buren, Missouri. There's a registration required for our cars. We've gotta go there. <laughs> it's a true story. Anyways, I lack knowledge on it. And so what I normally do, just so you guys know, Whenever I don't understand a topic, anything, I don't care what you, I don't care if it's the most advanced mathematics you've ever even encountered in your life. And you're like, I hate this. I hate pre-calculus. I get it. If you need wisdom and knowledge and understanding about any topic, no matter what it is, I know with certainty, you can ask the creator of the heavens and the earth, Yahuwah Elohim Sevoh, you can ask him and be like, help me have wisdom about this topic. And if you turn to this, you can start right here. Just go to, go to the very beginning, start there. This is my pocket sword. This is my pocket sword. This is a pocket knife. This is my pocket sword. Two edged, one edge. Most places, two edges is illegal. Something to consider. Lots of places, this is illegal. So when you need to know truth, come right back to the beginning. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the earth came to be formless and empty. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let light come to be, and light came to be. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim separated the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there came to be evening and morning, one day. And Elohim said, let it firmament, an expanse, come to be in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it came to be so. And Elohim called the firmament heavens, and there came to be evening, and there came to be morning the second day. And Elohim said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. And it came to be so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, and the collections of water he called seas. And the earth brought forth grass, the plant that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning the third day. And Elohim said, let the lights come to be in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it came to be so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. Listen, and there came to be evening and there came to be morning the fourth day. And Elohim said, let the waters teem with shoals of living beings and let birds fly above the earth on the face of the firmament of the heavens. And Elohim created great sea creatures and every living being that moves with which the waters teem according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good and Elohim blessed them saying, be fruitful and increase and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there came to be evening and there came to be morning, the fifth day. And Elohim said, let the earth bring forth the living being according to its kind livestock and creeping creatures and beasts of the earth according to its kind and it came to be so and Elohim made the beasts of the earth according to its kind livestock according to its kind 
and all that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creeping creatures that creep on the ground. And Elohim created the man in his image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And Elohim blessed them. And Elohim said to them, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over it fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over all creeping creatures of the earth. And Elohim said, see, I have given you every plant that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you. It is for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to every creeping creature on the earth in which there is a living being. Every green plant is for food and it came to be so. And Elohim saw all that he made and it was very good. And there came to be evening and there came to be morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their array. And in the seventh day, Elohim completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and set it apart because on it, he rested from all his work, which Elohim in creating had made. These are the births of the heavens and the earth when they were created in that day that Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens. Any time. I lack that preparedness. I didn't have my bug out bag ready to go that was built for twins. Chelsea and I had minimally prepared for one baby in an RV. That was it. So when we suddenly had two babies, I mean, we literally didn't even know what to do. We were on the phone with people that miraculously had had birth, given birth to twins unknowingly at a home birth as they were born. And I mean, it was a little scary to see my wife. I've never delivered my own children, totally, like unassisted, from midwifery. To be there and watch my wife completely give her body up. I mean, for 10 months, exactly. Like, for 40 weeks, she just gave her body up. And then her body devoured itself to keep them alive and to carry her twins to full term and then give birth naturally after three nights of labor. There was something that was, that was strengthening me in my innermost portion of my being during that, the, her labor, I had this positivity and this like excitement that was 40 weeks in preparation for like for 40 weeks, we've been waiting for the day that my wife is no longer pregnant. That sounds super selfish, but it's true. I wanted to get to where my wife was no longer totally in this phase of growing life. And I wanted to see her be healed because she was just withering away in front of my face. And it was so brutal to go from a wife who is so capable of helping me and has helped me for years and years and years like when I first came out, I think on the public scene for a lot of people, I was a train wreck. I was an absolute wretch of a mess because I was finally dealing with so much of the, the unrepentant sin in my life, the decades of generational warfare, curses and sins and demonic activity and witchcraft and sorcery and evil, like all of the 10 commandments I've broken, every one of them. But more than that, like I was, given myself i'd given myself over to the enemy i'd given myself over to him i'd seared off my conscience i just wanted to pursue hedonism which is where you just chase pleasure and our society cultivates that they they built themselves up to offer comfortability as the cure to hard days of labor to hard nights to all of the challenges that come in life. They're offering us an escape. This kingdom of darkness offers us an escape route. Whereas Yahuwah offers us one way in, one way out. Like dangerous, super sketchy. It could kill you trying to hike up there. One way in, one way out, mountain pass to get into the most beautiful Edenic Valley on the earth, to get into the Garden of Eden. You gotta go through one flaming sword that turns in all directions and a cherub that guards it. There's one way into that place, clearly. Otherwise he would have set multiple 
cherubim to guard it. But he's like, yeah, one, completely got it. Probably the most epic warrior that is not talked about too much in the scriptures. I can't even imagine. That being said, every time I hear about the warriors of scripture, just my mind just gets totally distracted into Gibberim. The mighty men of valor, the brave ones, David's savage warriors, and Yahuwah's angels. Make, they call them messengers in here, which are just ferocious, ferocious. But they're so good at like the chain of command and respect and authority and not, not jacking everything up so readily. Anyways, this is, the reason I'm saying this is because there's been some crazy spiritual warfare at times. This is a season of time of year where there's some horrific radical intelligent evil that takes place for a lot of people all over the earth. In, in particular, in the uh, places that have been poisoned by the royal crown places that adopted all of this like Babylonian witchcraft and evil and have given themselves to evil. There's great evil that they participate in on the solstices, the times when the sun is 12 hours, equinoxes. They have these different things that they're a part of. Anyways, it leads to a lot of radical intelligent evil and opening of the, the gates of, of, I mean, it's like people that try to open gates to hell. It's not a good idea, y'all. It brings out things that you can't even comprehend how radically intelligent they are and evil they are. But Yahuwah has given us this way of living that's separate from the way of the world that is removing itself from that pattern of life. And because of that, those evil spirits, they come to make war with us. They come to devour our families and our children and destroy marriages, destroy people fundamentally at their, from before they're even born. This entire society is even trying to convince people that babies don't are not to be guarded and protected. And you know what? They are to be most valued, precious to us to protect them. And you know what? Also the gray headed at the end of their life, it literally gives a commandment in the scriptures. It said, rise up, give reverence to the gray headed. Like when someone who's an elder who walks in the room, rise up and give reverence to it because they are literally walking memory books of life and lessons learned. And like the gray head literally is like wisdom, like sprouting out of you. Like, oh man, the humbling and the lessons that you can learn and glean from the elderly can give you perspective about the young and why they're this, I mean, not able to do anything for themselves for a long time. Heavy burden to carry. They're a burden to, to carry. And I remember when Chelsea was so burdened with child, I wanted to just, I wanted the babies to be born so I could help carry the burden because I saw what a taxation, what a heavy load it was on her all the time. And you know what? I've really gotten that now. And like, I'm actually rejoicing at it. Like it, it's a thing, my heart was turned from sorrow to gladness. Like his joy really did come for me in the morning. And it came because I diligently turned back to these, these words and I rebuked that darkness that can come in on the nights of despair and frustration and loneliness and exhaustion. And when you feel so unprepared and you realize you're in so far over your head and it's going to destroy you. Our father is so merciful. He loved us and set up the deliverance plan for us way before. And he knew we were gonna to get to that place. And he's been waiting for us to just come back to him wherever we are, no matter what circumstances we're encountering. This is how we can turn back to him. You open this book up. And even if you think you know nothing about it, even if you think you have no relationship with him whatsoever, he knows you, cares for you, longs for you to have a deep, intimate relationship with him that is actual, real, physical, friendship, family, true family who lays its life down for each other who gives and sacrifices for each other, who is willing to persevere with love. This book transforms me. I'm different every time I read it. And you know what? It, it comes out to me differently every time. And so I encourage you all, if you haven't just given this thing an entire read through, when you got a struggle with a, like a single issue that's predominantly consuming you, start from the beginning and go to the end. I could go to my phone app, my Bible app, and search for a word and look at from the beginning to the end of the scripture every time that verse shows up and try to pi picture together, stick it all together, what those verses all are talking about to get the definition of something out of the scripture. Like what is the definition of love from the scripture? What is the definition of marriage in the scripture? What is a definition of children in the scripture? And how do we define our job? What is our job? What is our duty here? This is where we get our identity. This is where we get our purpose, our calling, and it never deviates. It never leaves that straight and narrow path. It's unchangeable because Yahuwah said he's unchangeable. No one, otherwise all of us would be dead. Otherwise the sons of Jacob would perish. But let me just read to you one thing. 
No, no, probably a few more things because this is, this is life, man. I'm getting to experience life and I want you to experience life. Men were made to have a helper and his wife. It's the most beautiful thing ever and it's getting sweeter all the time. We're like 12 years into our marriage and like for real, it's been insane. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. I loaded up my entire family into an RV and shoved them off on the road anywhere. We left in all kinds of crazy parking lots for way too long, way too long, way too long that you're not just hanging out in the parking lot. Like there's clearly a family living in the back of this Walmart and they're like, what? And they're like, they're there. That's us, man. We were that family. A lot of Walmarts, a lot of other places too. We used to suburban, gorilla camping in suburban neighborhoods. We like to get into gated communities because I'm stealthy with my massive RV. I'll get in those gated communities because there's some tips and tricks I learned along the way, like major prayer, being like, Father, if we're supposed to sleep inside that gated community so the cops don't run us out of Walmart, please open that gate when we get there. Psh, gate opens up. You're like, you bitch. True story, true story. California was nuts. Anyways. My wife and I have gone through some incredibly horrible and awesome circumstances. When Naomi was born, we were literally having people who were coming against us physically, trying to shoot and murder us at different times when she was pregnant with that baby. We had some crazy stuff happen during the pregnancy time of our life. This season, it was like so peaceful. People were wonderful. We had lots of friends and support and everything we ever had though was blowing up around us. Like we moved 22 times in one year, last year, 22 times. It's a little tumultuous. My family's pretty seasoned at it, but that's still not ideal. It changed us so in so many ways, seeing her go through that pregnancy, go through this transformation to being a twin mom. And now we're like, we're two months into it and we're starting to see it's okay. We're gonna figure out a rhythm to this thing. And it's because Yahuwah made my wife and I together. Like as I finally start to accept our identity as like parents with children, that are now four children, that this is, this is good. It's a blessing. I'm not unprepared for it. The groundwork was laid for a long time. The father's been laying the groundwork for me to be a father to this son and to that daughter and to the two other daughters in there since I was a child. He's been raising me up from my mother's womb. And I know it because he literally raised us all up from one man. This is one of those sweet moments with Abraham. Rock hunting. He just got a little foot immersion. Is it good? You like it? Yeah. My man, Abraham. I love him. But boy, can he be a tester of times. Sweet man. Does it feel good to get some sun? Little tiny linen night. Look at this sweet little linen outfit. People are epic. They send you linen garments. That's quite special. Now listen to this. And Elohim, Yahuwah Elohim, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. And Yahuwah Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. And Yahuwah Elohim said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. And from the ground, Yahuwah made, formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, the living being, that was its name. So the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to the every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper for him as was his counterpart. So Yahuwah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which Yahuwah Elohim had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, yet they were not ashamed. There's a lot of nakedness in marriage. And I'm not just talking about the time spent between the sheets. I'm talking about being laid bare, okay? That word, arem, in Hebrew, it's like taking off King Saul when he went to visit the medium, the witch, the sorcerer, woman who had a familiar spirit is what you would call it. Today we would use modern nomenclature and call it a witch. Somebody who has a familiar spirit, like a spirit that works together with them, they're like uh, always in a parasitic relationship. Just gonna, always a parasitic relationship. However, 
where that spirit and that person have a yoking together, a, a soul tie, spiritual contract, and they interact together in between the two realms, okay? This is people that talk to the dead, do necromancy, that kind of stuff. It's much more popular these days, just because the world has turned away from the morality that's found here. As soon as it turns back to this with all its heart, we're gonna read about Isaiah 58. What can happen when we repent? The power of the weapon of repentance. Anyways, King Saul, this is the king right before King David. He goes to visit this witch because Yahuwah is not answering him when he cries out and pray. Ever experienced that? I have, lots. He's desperate. The Philistines are coming to destroy him and his entire city. Not only that, his kingdom potentially. He is in absolute dread. Samuel the prophet is dead. He tries to inquire of Yahuwah. Yahuwah doesn't answer him. So he instead goes and finds a medium, someone who has this familiar spirit. And he goes to her and he takes off. He gets naked, okay? But it doesn't say that directly. It's like he takes off his kingly garments. He makes himself naked and strips himself down to a different garment, like his his mantle. The, the, the thing that people could look at and know that that was the king of Israel, the mantle of authority. He took it off and he set it down and he put on the mantle, this fake mantle of a commoner, of, of a nobody, so that he could conceal himself to get into there. And the woman even asked him, because it was illegal at the time, it was an executable offense to practice in witchcraft at that time. They would kill you if they saw you had a familiar spirit. They were following the Torah in that regard. King Saul is the one who instituted that. And now King Saul is going back on that and going into the back rooms of the uh, shadier part of town in order to get his little time in sorcery and divination. He asked her to summon the prophet Saul or prophet Samuel because he was dead. And she normally interacts with this other familiar spirit. Well, this spirit that rises up is actually Samuel because she sees him coming in his man. And I should just read it to you. It's just so good, y'all. The scripture is so interconnected. It's just like the most beautiful tapestry of a woven rug you've never known. It's just elegant. Anyways, check this out. Let's see this. The sovereign sent to call Ahimelech. No, man, it's after that. This is right at the end. This is literally what brings on Saul's death and the death of his sons, because generational curses are a real thing. And there it is. You ready for this? And Shaul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and he said, please divine for me and bring up for me the one I shall name. So this is necromancy. He wants her to do some necromancy magic. It's risky stuff, dude. Only ever ends in total radical intelligent evil infestation. Like I'm gonna go swallow some parasitic worms for the day. Not a good idea, y'all. And Shaul disguised himself and put on other garments and he went with two men by him and they came to the woman by night and he said, please divine for me and bring up for me the one I shall name. But the woman said to him, look, you know what Shaul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to put me to death? And Shaul swore to her by Yahuwah saying, as Yahuwah lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this matter. So he swears an oath on the name of Yahuwah to do evil. Do you, this is when Saul broke the major commandment. This is like, this is like blood contracts with demons. This is what he's doing out of, out of the mouth of the king. And the woman said, whom do I bring up for you? So he said, bring up Shemuel for me. And the woman saw Shemuel. She cried out with a loud voice. She cried out because she was scared because her normal familiar spirit that masquerades as dead people's relatives or dead people's celebrities because that's who talks to you when it's necromancy like when i first came out and was like really on a lot of now you see t i was on a bunch of like shows doing interviews about my past being raised in a total occult half christian half totally occult family sounds strange it's very common there is a mixture of those two uh babylonian magic and christianity that's horrifyingly effective right now and just dangerous beyond measure anyways part of what you see there is that there is people that are going towards this, like, I wanna to talk to dead spirits, right? And so they're willing to do something for these evil spirits, in a sense, if that's to pay a lady, a sorcerer like this some money. That person calls up with their spirit that will transform itself. It says that the devil can transform himself, metaskitzmazatoi, be a transformer, and, and his apostles like him, meaning like his lesser servants, the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness can shapeshift. 
to look like other stuff, okay? It says, don't marvel at that the enemy can transform himself as an angel of light. Like, don't bow down and worship him just because it looks like your sister, just because it looks like your mom and your grandma or whatever it may be. But anyways, at the time when I was coming out about this stuff, I was super passionate and I used to go out prayer walking all the time. Walk in the streets of my neighborhood that were filled with all kinds of horrible stuff. Children being butchered in our neighborhood at the time, public news, crazy nasty stuff. This is Colorado, like the new capital of the earth, new world order capital, which is crazy. Anyways, we were walking the neighborhood all the time, praying specifically that the Father would forgive the sins that were being committed in that area, to pardon the sins of ignorance, the sins of willful transgression, the sins of iniquity, that he would pardon and remove the crookedness from that, that land, that he would have mercy on the people that were in there and bring them, remove the scales from there. I was interceding for my neighbors. Like I wanted them to be set free because I saw the bondage that we're in and I grew up in that and I knew what it was like to be on the victim side of that and to be with being raised with perpetrators on that side of that. And the torture and the mental anguish of what that causes in families so polluted my concept of family for so long that I felt like I had to scorn all versions of family, that families were evil, families were wicked, families are where horror comes from, nightmares come from, trauma comes from and confusion comes from. And I was no shalom. I was without shalom. And, I, and so my heart is grieved for those who are in bondage because they don't, they, they don't have peace anymore. They're desperate for peace and they've lost it. They don't know. They don't know that. Not for like a day of their life. And I wanted them to be free. And anyways, one of my friends who has a skateboarding ministry Evan, you're awesome. Hey. Come here. We're gonna take a picture real quick. Come on. No, Nate, can you do that? <laughs> okay, yes. If you're in Denver, skate ministry, <laughs> crushing it. A guy who is like on the front line, saving and rescuing babies, and him and his wife are super fruitful and multiplying, and they're also, I caught up to him, family of six. He's an intercessor and he goes and tries to, to minister to people that are considering abortions and trying to get them to consider passive adoption and different options. Anyways, he's an interceder for people and a, and a potent minister of Yahuwah. I love him. He has a skate ministry out there and he goes to the skate park specifically to try to hunt for the souls of men. He's like fishing for men. He goes there and tries to get to know the guys there and gals there and try to like minister to them and be a a man who's willing to participate in life with young men and women and see them have discipleship in their life. He's fantastic. But he met this guy at the skate park who was covered in major Luciferian, specifically Luciferian and um, Wisdom of Solomon style black magic. He was covered in tattoos of it in, in all of the sigil rings and all this stuff. A deep occultist. Anyways. He got to know him and started hearing his story and he knew my testimony, Evan knew my testimony and what I came from. And he was like, hey, would you reach out to this guy and connect with him and go visit with him? And uh, and so I did. And I started getting to know him and we went and met at a Starbucks coffee shop. He was like super agitated. And anytime you know you're gonna probably have an encounter with demonic spirits, like I was, you, you, pray specific, you pray pretty specifically. It's like a time of not messing around with fasting. Like fasting is super critical and making sure your heart's in right and you've repented for sins. You're asking the Father to cover any doors you have opened to the enemy that you're unaware of with the blood of the Lamb and have mercy on you and guard you from that until you can repent for it. Like if there's any area of my life where I have doors open to the enemy, man, when you go into a demonic like deliverance session, you gotta go into a place where somebody's needing ministering, you better make sure your hearts are right. And I still was right in the middle of trying to come out of a lot of this stuff. And I was actively dealing with a lot of family members that were still trying to re-engage and bring me back into it and pursue and kind of institute vengeance against my family for, for leaving it and then telling others about it. And this man sat down with me, younger guy, in his probably late, late, late teens, early 20s. And I mean, rippling with agitation and like, like tension, like he could not sit still, like, like he was burning up and, and twisted up. And I got to hear his story because he had heard mine. He and I got to understand each other on a, on a level that was different than just Bible guy and like Satanist. We came at it from a totally different connection point. 
because I had a relational history with what kind of bondages that he had been ensnared in. And what had gotten him sucked down into that road where he's, he's now this high priest in this coven that is operating in Denver, one of the, the priests in this coven, and they're participating in black magic, Crowley and black magic stuff, really evil, radical, intelligent, evil stuff, like Ezekiel 8 and 9. Read that if you want an idea of the kind of stuff they were participants of. Anyways, they were caught up. He got to that stage because he saw a specific horror happen when he was young, his sister killing herself. He saw her commit suicide. And he, during that moment, took it on completely, his identity, that it was his fault. That it was his fault because he was the last one to talk to her. He was the last one to say anything to her and before she died. And so he had this just utterable self-condemnation, survivor's guilt, just, uh, it was all my fault. Like, and he just developed, like it just, the adversary just took it and just twisted it to consume him next, right? Because this is the adversary that we contend with. Like he's a devourer, like devourers. Like it said when they threw the adversaries of Daniel into the lion's den and they received the punishment that they had set up against him, when they did that, it said that the lions tore them apart before their bodies touched the ground. That's a devourer. Like that's the adversaries we're wrestling with. And he got consumed by it. And one of these spirits began to pester him and tempt him and talk to him and entice him that he could give her, he could give him one conversation with his sister again and that she and him could be restored. And so they did a, he specifically engaged in magic to do that and did a ritual and got to have what he thought was a conversation with his sister. And he got to tell her all these things that he wanted to tell her for all these years of his life. Like one last time to say, I'm sorry. It's like just to beg for forgiveness. Like it had consumed him for so long. And he got to have this conversation with what he thought was his sister. And she looked just like the person that he knew. And she's right there in front of him and he gets to talk to her and has this unbelievable emotional connection. And he finally gets freedom from this burden that he's been carrying for all these years. And right in that moment, the thing shapeshifts back to this radically evil, hideous monstrosity and mocks him and then torments him with that moment over and over again in dreams and in nightmares, just tormented him. And he just got infested with more evil spirits. It just was like a gutter that everything from the kingdom of darkness could pump down into a realm of evil. And it just took over his body, hijacked him and led him down a life of years of, of committing atrocities, horrible things. And here he is sitting with me in a coffee shop, trying to get freedom, trying to get out of this and terrified because he is being riddled by these parasites that are just leeching off of him. These are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim like read Genesis chapter six, if you want to understand a basic understanding of where these evil spirits, these restless spirits that have this insatiable lust and hunger that just always needs more. It's like the eyes are never satisfied, it says in the scriptures. Like you could see all of this beauty and you know what? I want to see more. I want to see Edenic beauty. I want to see trees that are so fruitful. Like this tree literally right up here is dropping down mulberries. Like the sweetest fruit you've ever had. Tiny little berry. It's like a blackberry, but only sweet, like perfect blackberry ever. It's just raining out of the sky. I just want this whole thing around me to be filled with that. Like, I want more. There's in us, it's hardwired in us to desire more. And that, that desire devoured his life. And I got to share with him how that same desire for pleasure devoured mine. I wanted relief. I wanted escape. I wanted out of the life. I wanted out of family. I wanted away from family. That was my solution. And I ran into the kingdom of darkness to get my deliverance. And his, his desperate desire was repentance was forgiveness and he ran into the kingdom of darkness and you know what we both needed to meet on the straight and narrow and right there in that coffee shop i explained to him in simple layman terms the effective prayers of a fervent effective prayers of a righteous man avail much and we got to sit there and pray together which was just us talking it wasn't some like there's none of that sit there talking to him other people in the restaurant sit in the cafe sitting and having conversations and this guy over here is having demons manifest on his face and guttural sounds and yet by the authority and the power of yeshua working through me into him he was able to get to understand and have reverence for yahuwah understand that the truth was not that he had sinned and caused the death of his sister the truth was not 
that he was destined to be tormented the rest of his life. The truth was that he was made, breathed in the very nostrils of Yahuwah, breathed onto him and gave him life, gave him a purpose, gave him a destiny and a calling and the devourer is trying to consume him. And he has hope because you know what? We have seen deliverance come as dark as the nights get. Those You may be in the valley of the shadow of death. Yahuwah can raise you up from there in a moment of time. He can make that sun shine on you and it reveals all things though you are in the cloudiness, though you're in the place of despair and loneliness, he can immediately change your circumstances in here, give you shalom in here so that you can be at peace out here. Yes, my daughter. You can come down, but make sure you tell mom Tell her, I'm all right with you coming down. Shalom in the home. That man got major deliverance and he got deliverance specifically from that shape-shifting spirit that entered in when he performed this necromancy like this woman's doing. When that spirit, that was like the strong man spirit that had like all these lesser spirits in him. When that strong man got bound up and cast out of him, he lifted up literally his countenance that had been down and anxious and scared the whole time, lifted up. And he could see clearly, literally could see clearly and was just in his sound mind again. And it was just like, he was so relieved. He was so relieved. He had peace. He had his mind back. And like, he didn't need six weeks of rehab in a locked facility with pharmaceuticals and straitjackets and quiet rooms. I've worked in that industry. I worked in the fields of psychology and how we should treat these patients, you know, these schizophrenics or whatever bipolar or whatever version of it that they want to put on you from the newest DSM-5 ranking system with 50,000 diseases. No, he was being tormented by an evil spirit and the simple deliverance was what he needed. He needed the word of Elohim and he needed repentance and mercy and deliverance. And you know what? He went out of there in a sound mind. That was not because I was there. I was willing and obedient to do the work Yahuwah had prepared me for, even though I was afraid. What if these evil spirits, that this get this cult and coven that are that are with him, because I get him out, oh, they're all gonna target me. Now I've got more people trying to kill us, more people trying to destroy our lives. And you know what? It totally happened. His coven freaked out because he was completely out. And now he's like proselytizing and telling all these people about Yeshua and telling them they need deliverance and telling them they need to read the word. Like, different person, different person immediately. The, the kingdom of darkness wants to then just destroy that. Or they try to target the ministers that are like active on the front line trying to bring deliverance in the lives of others. It's a complicated war out there, y'all. And there's battles that are being fought behind the scenes by ministers, people that like, that don't have regular day jobs, but they are the guys that you can call up at two in the morning and they'll come intercede with you through stuff like that, through the loss of a child, through horrible circumstances. Like Yahuwah can send you at any time, anywhere to be a, a, a source of depression lifting hope. And that's like literally what my wife and I were made to be. Like we were made to be exhorters. The champion of the Philistines, the Gevor, has drawn himself out from the congregation of the Philistines. I see him out there. A pineapple. No, listen, listen. Go under the shade. As Millenites, we just got to make our daily bread. It doesn't matter how pretty it is. It just matters that it's delicious and nourishing. And these tortillas and these potato tacos I made today were amazing. I don't know if it was the sourdough starter added in there, added a little little some sour and extra to it or if it was the barley you guys barley oh barley is so good it's got such great flavor anyway um mill away hope you guys are having a great day i just had to show you my little tortilla fail of the day but it wasn't really a fail it just if vanity were speaking vanity would say oh those are ugly tortillas but they were absolutely delicious and i call that a win made to be people that can come alongside people who are down in the gutter because we've been in that same gutter a lot like we're homeless right now like we do not have a home that's ours at all and we have not experienced that one day in our marriage like we went from our well we did it for 45 days we went from not our own home moved into a friend's basement and then we were waiting to buy our rv 
but we've had a house basically that's ours since we were married since we were on the road and so for us to like sell the rv was pretty crushing devastating bye bestie you've been good to us you sweet girl Mama. this is not the end of the linen railroad though <laughs> The railroad has many more stops to make, doesn't she? <laughs> it's kind of weird, isn't it? It's been savage, Ugh. wonderful, terrifying. And beautiful. All Great, time. all at the same time. She has been on so, such a journey. So have we. And uh, Ooh, now it's time for new beginnings. Y'all's got something else in store. Because you're like, there goes all of what we thought we had financial like wealth in, goes right out. And you're like, we lost a lot of money. Part of life, lessons learned. Yahuwah can totally restore things. But we are experiencing this season and we're like, well now we can relate to a whole different bunch of people now. Like we can relate to a totally different set of people because we've been able to go to, through those circumstances. And you know, even if we're still in them, that from the gutters we stand and we preach to people and we say, you know what, Yahoo is still good. He is faithful. You can trust him no matter what you're going through. Like do not grow weary. Like do not grow weary. Like my children are rejuvenated. They have hope and joy. They're coming down here invigorated and full of life. And you know what? Praise Yah. It's a new day to them. To them it's like, a lifetime. To me, it's like another day, but to them, it's a lifetime today. They're gonna come down here and I have the opportunity to be a dad to them and to this one and to be my wife. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful I have family that I didn't stay with the witches of Endor, that I didn't stay with the kingdom of darkness, that I continue to drive on even if I get stuck down in it for a while. Praise Yahuwah that he appoints people, solid ministers of Yah, who are power in the word and mighty in their song, like Lyndon and Ruth, man, they pump me up. We got to go see and, and fellowship with them out at Parable of the Vineyard last week. And it was just like, we've not been able to leave our house hardly with the twins. And, but they're getting, they're getting better. And we're like, we can go get, we could go get groceries. Like we could do this. Like we're going to be okay. Tons of fish, Look. tons. There's good moments. Tons, 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 oh, yeah. tons, 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 Oh yeah. Rumble butt. Way to oh, go, yeah. buddy. Poop butt. <clears throat> Anyways, That's we're down by. That's how relaxed. <laughs> oh, passes okay. gas without screaming. <laughs> Lots of uh, drop pipe water. We wild harvested chamomile. We found some ginger. And children like to make that face. You're like, smile, smile nice. And they're all like, there you go. <laughs> um, there's still face. hope. No matter how horrible it is, there's still hope. Oh these are good sweet moments. Like we could go see people. We could go see we could go see people. It's hilarious. But we did. We we're like, yes. So I just cried so much during worship because I just I gotta I gotta worship with brothers and sisters and be like, yes. Like they're doing this thing called Hebrew Fest in, in July. It's gonna be epic music, like ridiculous powerful worship. How do you get across? What do you think? Bridge. bridge? How far away is the bridge? Okay, where's the other bridge? Okay, what's another way you could get across? Walk right through. Does it look easy to walk through there? Look for an easy spot to walk through. They're coming. 
Last chapter, okay. I got a little sidetracked, it's exciting. Ready? And when the woman saw Shemuel, she cried out with a loud voice saying, why have you deceived me? You yourself are Shaul. So now she understands exactly what's going on, okay? And he said to her, what is his form? Oh, wait, sorry. And the sovereign said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Shaul, I saw a spirit coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. He still has a mantle intact because Samuel was a Nazarite from birth because Hannah prayed hard and diligently. She was grieved in her spirit. She was married to a man and she could not have a child and she was barren and she was grieved at it. And the other wife was constantly vexing her, like making fun of her and shoving her face in it that she didn't have children and she did. And she was desperate and she cried out to Yahuwah and she said, you know what, if I'll make a deal with you. She's like, I'll make a vow to Yahuwah. She made a vow to him. King Saul made a vow to the witch. Kings, and you at any time can make a vow to any of these beings. You can be all in, man. If you want to be all into the kingdom of darkness, do it with all your might. If you want to be all in for kingdom of Yahuwah, do it with all your might. She made a vow and was like, if you give me a child, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you from this birth. She's like, I'll give him to you. He's yours. She's like, yours. That's a literal legal thing that happens in the scriptures. If you read the Torah, the, the first five books, the loving instructions of Yahuwah, they talk about this stuff. Where you be like, literally, you can take your son and give him over to the Levites. Like, let him be adopted to be a servant, a bond servant. You could sell them to the temple where they could be raised up in the ways of Yah, taught to follow the ordinances and the righteous paths of Yahuwah, even if they were an outsider. It's like a miracle that you could ever have this relationship like that. But Hannah made a vow to him and she was like, I will never shave his head and he will not come near any of the fruit of the vine. She made him a Nazarite from birth and he never defiled his Nazarite vow. Like he was still in the mantle of his authority. The butterfly? Oh my. Hold on, I gotta check out this butterfly. Keep looking. An old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And Shaul knew that it was Shemuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. And Shemuel said to Shaul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Shaul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines are fighting against me. And Elohim has turned aside from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. So I've called you to reveal to me what I should do. Then Shemuel said, and why do you ask me? Seeing Yahuwah has turned aside from you and has become your enemy. Nice, play it up, girl. And Yahuwah has done for himself as he spoke by me. For Yahuwah has torn the rain out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. Because you did not obey the voice of Yahuwah nor execute his burning wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, Yahuwah has done this matter to you today. Further, Yahuwah also gives Yisrael with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons with me. Yahuwah gives the army of Yisrael into the hand of the Philistines. And immediately Shaul fell on the ground, his complete length and greatly feared because Yahuwah of the words of Shemuel. And there was no strength in him for he had not eaten food day or night. See the fasting to talk to spirits. And the woman came to Shaul and saw that he had been greatly disturbed and said to him, See, your female servant has obeyed your voice, and I put my life in my hands and have listened to the words which you spoke to me. And now please listen to the voice of your female servant. So who's he about to obey? The witch. Not good. You see why Yahuwah is so upset with him, huh? Yeah. See, your female servant has obeyed your voice, and I put my life in my hands and listen to the words which you spoke to me. And please listen to the voice of your female servant too, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat so that you have strength when you go out on your way. But he refused and said, I am not going to eat. But his servants, should be his most trusted associates, urged him together with the woman and he listened to their voice. So he rose from the ground and sat on her bed and ate a meal with her. Mm. And the woman had a fatted calf in the house and she quickly slaughtered it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. And she brought it before Shaul and his servants and they ate and rose up and went away that night. He spent the whole day with her. He had a feast with the witch after he'd sinned. And after Samuel told him, you're not obeying my voice. She entered into a covenant with him to protect her life. It's a salt covenant. They ate this bread together. This is why, man, you don't, you don't lay hands on people hastily and you best pray for your food too. Like we pray, we ask the father to forgive any sins committed by any of the individuals who are making any of the food. And we ask that every curse that's in there would be broken in the name of Yeshua because he gave us permission and authority to pray that every curse causeless would not light against us. 
and we can pray that this food will be cleansed and that anything not beneficial in it would pass through our bodies without making us sick. Yeshua literally said, you can eat any deadly thing and it will not cause you harm. But you gotta be walking straight and narrow, y'all. Real critical. Samuel was walking the straight and narrow. Shaul ended up in his death. He ended up in a covenant with a witch at the very last day of his life. He entered into a covenant with a witch and then he went to his death the next day. But you know what? Yahuwah promised us this great deliverance of all. This is it, Isaiah 58. Last thing. I know y'all are eager to hear more of the word and I'm eager to play with my children. We've got to do some exploring. Hey, who can find me seven different leaves? Seven different leaves. Small ones, big ones, tiny ones, thin ones, wide ones, fat ones. Check this out. Yeshayahu, Isaiah 58. I started looking up naked in the Bible. That's the place you should look up naked in the Bible. Nowhere else. I found a beetle. Beetle? Yeah. That's good. You should pick him up. Inspect him closely. Observe him keenly. He's what? He's gonna bite you. Less likely than anything. How big? No way. You show me a beetle that big. You show it to me right now. If you catch that beetle, I will literally give you a piece of something yummy. I'll give you honey with bread on it. I'll put a little bit of bread on top of the big pile of honey. If you catch me a beetle that big, you got it. Isaiah 58. This is where the father boat got, got me when I was looking up naked. Stripped bear. No authority anymore. Someone else is ruling yeah, over you now. It was a fly. It was a fly. Oh my gosh. It was a big fly. That's a horse fly. Those things have razors on their tongues. They have razor blades for a mouth. They open their mouth and only... Because they... They lick animals and slice their skin open and drink their blood. That's literally what they do. They're, so their tongues look like tiny little razor blades. They like to bite horses and cows in particular. Why? Because they've got, they're really big and it's hard to reach everywhere. They don't have hands. They're super vulnerable. So Yahweh gave them a tail, a savage tail that can cut them in half. Praise be to Yah. Dad, Dad, come here. What'd you find? Naomi, get over there with her. Man, that's too exciting. Bring it near. What in the world is going on there, Jane? Oh, man. Caterpillar egg. Look at that. <laughs> Treasures. Look at the colors. I'm are they wait. fuzzy? I'm going to go show mom. Yes, you should. Well, well sure, why you... Isaiah 58. Cry aloud. Do not spare. Lift up your voice like the shofar. Declare to my people their transgression and the house of Yaakov their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the right ruling of their Elohim. They ask of me rulings of righteousness. They delight in drawing near to Elohim. They say, why have we fasted and have you not seen? Why have we afflicted our beings and you look not on us? Look, in the day of your fasting, you find pleasure and drive on all your laborers. Look, you fast for strife and contention and to strike with the fist of wrongness. You do not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. It is a fast I, I it is a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his being. It is to bow down his head like a bulrush, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes. Do you call this a fast and an acceptable day to Yahuwah? Is not the fast that I have chosen to loosen the tight cords of wrongness, to undo the bonds of the yoke, to exempt the oppressed, and to break off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? when you see the naked and cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light would break forth like the morning, your healing spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The esteem of Yahuwah would be your rear guard. Then when you call, Yahuwah would answer. When you cry, he would say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking of unrighteousness, if you extend your being to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted being, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness be as noon. Then Yahuwah would guide you continually and satisfy your being in drought and strengthen your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And those from among you shall build the old way places you shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you would be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. 
If you do not, if you do turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my set apart day, and shall call the Sabbath a delight, the set apart day of Yahuwah esteem, and shall esteem it not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in Yahuwah, and I shall cause you to ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the inheritance of Yaakov your father, for the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken. This is our calling. This is our mission statement. When we lack our identities, we go to him. And you know what? He takes that mantle of worldliness, that, that, that false illusion of, of deliverance that we sought in the ways of the world. Yahuwah is not interested in remediating symptoms. Yahuwah is all about delivering people cures, true cures, not a race for the cure foundation, the cure foundation. And it came through the deliverance that his son showed us by walking out the loving instructions of Yahuwah completely to living a distinct life from the ways of the world, oh, to being set apart, to setting apart the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. Me. You sit yeah, down, eating, you, you rest, wow. you fellowship, you read, you eat, you enjoy him, you enjoy each other. Family, relational time with your father is more important than what you can accomplish on Saturday, is more important than what you can accomplish on the seventh day. Your time with him, your time with each other, your time with your brothers and sisters in the faith is more powerful and more important to you and it's for a blessing that is supposed to be then turned outward and sought out day after day, the six days we labor out there, eager to contend for the souls of men, eager to advance the kingdom of Yahuwah in the world of darkness. No matter how dark it is, he can make our light shine like the sun. That's what I got, a turtle. <laughs> I love the red-eared sliders. Obviously, I want her shell, but Naomi told me no. But this one's super grumpy, meet Penelope. Oh! <laughs> Listen to the sound. Hold on. Oh, this is Rose. She's super snuggly and sweet. She's an alligator snapping turtle and she is marvelous and tiny. Oh my Rose don't even hurt. <laughs> don't oh my even gosh. hurt. She's adorable. Look at that long little snake like neck. She's adorable. Check this Look at out. Her long tail, too. Nay, move your hand a little. Let us let's see her tail. Nice. Woo. Oh, Rose is adorable. Rose is adorable. Now, Penelope is super grumpy. Ah! <laughs> She's vicious and snuggly. Look at her mouth open. <laughs> oh, gross. Anyways, sorry. be considerate. Some turtles are grumpy. Jimmy, your nose is in snapping oh. rage. Watch out, Jimmy! Even in the dark valleys. We've had some dark valleys, but you know what? Yahoo is faithful to pull us through. And from the many armory, I feel like we have an armory of prayer warriors out there who help to fuel those prayers. So I ask you to pray for the other people who are going through seasons of darkness, seasons of despair, seasons of fear and loneliness that you guys would intercede for your brothers and sisters, even if they're not in the kingdom of Yah yet. Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to know him, the true knowledge of him, which is the fear of him. And they would be freed from the fears of all other things. So may Yahuwah deliver you from all of your fears and teach you to be diligently fearful and reverent of him. I love you all. I'll talk to you soon.